How are we doing everyone and welcome to episode 16 of Talking to Mod. Now this week we have singer-songwriter and author Simon Mason and we're going to be talking everything from music, of course, Oasis, Nebworth, addiction, sobriety and of course the Hightown Pirates. So sit back, relax and enjoy episode 16 of Talking to Mod. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Are you in Italy or Belfast? Uh, Costa del Belfast today. Belfast. How are you doing? I'm all good, my friend. You? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm all right, thanks. Well, first of all, mate, I want to thank you for uh, joining me on Talking to Mod. Um, you know, this is me talking to you as a friend now, not as a guest. I appreciate what you're going through and for you to take time in doing this. And, uh, you know, you know, I've got love and respect for you, mate. And uh, just thank you. All right. Right, my friend. That's okay. Do you want to? Should we, should we explain what that actually means to anyone who's who cares to know? Yeah, sure. Let's let's. So, for anyone who's remotely interested, my mum died um, eight days ago, and, and um, it's not the easiest week of my life. But you might be surprised to hear that it's also not the hardest. So. So it's in a, well, I'm just in a process and um, like my learned friend Ben there, um, I, don't, I don't resort to drink or, uh, or drugs of any description to avoid my feelings. Um, so the last six days of my mum's life um, was spent by a bedside in the hospital in Bristol. I mean, and I was obsessed by the syringe for the morphine they gave me. <laughs> I was like looking at it, and the nurse was going, "You're all right, Mike." It's a long story, love. <laughs> but um, but I'm entitled, and I've earned the right to to inhabit my feelings, you know, for every waking minute of the day, and and I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, thank you, mate, because I know this is going to be a very good episode, and uh. There's going to be a lot of messages in there that people can relate to. And again, mate, um, no words that I can say to you or give you will ever change anything or help out. But the fact that you're still going through that and you're sober is massive, mate. So Listen, just once again, my mum died isn't going to give me some magical power to be able to drink sensibly. Do you know what I mean? Why would I do that? No, exactly, man. Exactly. Would I do? That would just be so fucking selfish of me, you know, to just heap all that kind of madness to my family my sister my missus oh my mum's died i'm gonna have a drink and that's of course fucking selfish so you know what truth is and it hasn't even crossed my mind not for a millisecond not for a second have i thought about drinking or using or acting out in any way actually i haven't i haven't gone on a shopping fucking bender <laughs> I just felt it, you know, I just felt it because, you know what, they're my feelings, man, and, um, and, and I avoided them for, you know, just great, briefly, for people who don't know, you know, I've been clean for 17 years now, but, you know, so I was 36 when I got clean, but from the age of 13 to 36, I used drugs every day of my life, heroin, crack, Valium, alcohol, you fucking name it, anything you could put in a syringe went in my body, so... You know, I, I, had, um, I had quite a time off feeling stuff that I didn't want to feel. And um, like I said, I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, my life is so much better, clean. So. Good man, good man. And that's one thing we've got in common now is the sobriety. But let's talk about something that everyone's got in common, and that is a passion for love of music. Okay. So when did you first get involved in music, mate? Right. Involved as in when did I start buying records or when did I start when did you music? when did music make sense to you because I mean everyone's had music in their life, but when did you truly go out and go, do you know what this album hits a different way oh, oh god this is <laughs> so I, I don't want people to think I'm like the most morbid person in the world, but when my dad died when I was very little when I was eleven I, um I was already listening to music I had a a couple of friends, I had a mate with an older brother, 
Um, I mean, I'm 55 now, so I caught the tail end of punk. Um, but the band that I fell in love with was was your mate, Paul Weller, um, at the jam. And shortly after my dad died, when I was 11 years old, and I was in this boarding school, and it was horrible. It was just a fucking horrible place to be in a, and a really tragic event. Uh, one of the older kids came to my room one night and sent me this compilation tape, this C90 compilation set. And on it was stuff like the jam and the pistols and the specials and the ruts and the who. A lot of that very angry music, because, you know, there was a lot of anger, righteous indignation, you can call it. And you know, my world had just fallen apart. You know, my old man was my hero and, and I lost him when I was very young, 11. And um, my mum took, you know, I had my mum for another 44 years. So, <laughs> But now I'm officially a grown up. I've got no parents. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. But um, here we go, 55. I suppose I better embrace it. Anyway, so so I had music and, and, um, and I had this fucking horrible school and it was and it was brutal. And I ended up I was getting sexually abused by the priests. So it was all quite grim and um and music saved my life so i wasn't listening because i thought it was cool or you know i was listening because it fucking saved my life see thing as you that's, are all right fuck man that's the i weren't ready for that on a tuesday night but again that's the best moment isn't it i mean going back to the jam you mentioned mate i mean you know they're my favorite band I mean, they were well, I incredible. When I was, so I was 12, and I had a mate at school who was 13, and he had really cool parents, kind of like we are now. You know, cool yeah. parents, right? And um, he, we were both obsessed with the jam, and um, he came into school one day, and he said, my mum and dad have got the pair of going to the jam at um, Stafford Bingley Hall. So it was on something they called the Bucket and Spade Fun Tour, 1980. 81 maybe so i was 12 12 and a half so i remember queuing up outside this massive agricultural hall in the middle of fucking nowhere and i had a little black black and white shoes on ten benson's tucked away and i'm um, just being in this queue of people and, and i was probably the youngest by a few years i remember this older kid stood a few feet in front of me going, oh, look, they've sold out, the kids are in. I was like, fuck off, mister. <laughs> and I went and we got in and we were in and um, felt part of something. Like school didn't make sense to me. Religion, Christianity, none of that stuff. It was all bollocks. It didn't make any sense to me at all. I could see the lies and the hypocrisy. I wasn't, I wasn't having it. But that made sense to me. You know, there was something about the music and the clothes and and that was it. It, it i was um i was converted they were unbelievable live i mean i i list i still listen to them religiously every day you know i mean for those listening and that um my favorite album is setting suns but uh i've been moving towards the gift a lot lately i mean that is just an absolute masterpiece of music isn't it eh? you got a favorite album from them <sighs> Sound effects, probably. Just, just because Man in the Corner Shop is one of the greatest songs ever written. Beautiful. Um, but when I did my one-man show based on my book in London, my walk on shit was ghosts. So, you know, so we've, both, we've talked about that before. It's, you know, one day you'll walk right out of this life and then you'll wonder why you didn't, why you didn't try. try. Yeah. That's some loving. You know, that just... And, you know, when I knew Matey back in the day, um, I did say to him, you know, I thanked him. And when I met Johnny Marr a few years ago, um, and I'd sent a copy of, of my book to Johnny Marr and, and he'd read it. And, and there's a bit in my book where it says, you know, that first Smiths album, you know, the jam had split up. And um, I was kind of into big country for, for about a year um but but then i saw the smiths on on top of the pops and i was like oh thank god <laughs> you know because uh, I, yeah just because why not the smiths were amazing you know um and so i i actually got to thank both those people whether and johnny Moore, and say look you know I, my situation in my life 
when you were you know, making those records was 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 so un, I was so unhappy, and uh, you saved my life. <laughs> No, it's mad how music can play a massive role in your life, really, isn't it? I mean, as I said, I've, I've, I went recently to a, a conversation with Noel Gallagher, <clears throat> and um, one of the questions, or it weren't a question. Back us that dropping names. No, no, no. no. Listen, oh, you, were, no, you, were, no. you were free no, one up at the moment. Clunk. But he, three one. The, um, yeah, yeah. He, Felix White, there's another one, from the Maccabees, he was hosting, and he, he mentioned, he said, I just want to, well, I've got this moment. Thank you, Noel, because your music plays such a big role in people's life, whether they're feeling sad, whether they're happy, they listen to your music and you make them forget about everything. And I thought, you know what, like, it's so true. Like, we've all been there. We've all had a moment where we don't feel great or whatever, and we put on an album and it just hits home differently. You mentioned a bit about your book there and your one-man show. I was going to go on to that a bit later on, but let's just go for it, mate. I've read your book, and I know a lot of people have as well. You've done, been very successful with that book. And there's, for those of you who haven't read it, I truly recommend it because it is – I should have had it next to me, really, but, I mean, as it's going to be edited, no one would have fucking seen it anyway because, you know, it's just audio. But – for those of you who are watching, I should have had it. But um, it is a fantastic book, Simon. And I mean, when I met you, um, first of all, do you remember when we did first meet? Yeah, yeah. And you said to me, no, you said you were commenting about my shoes, but I was, I was too pissed to even understand. I was, that, that was back in tell the heyday. You know? Tell a lot about a man by his shoes, mate. I had them uh, pretty green desert boots on, I think, mate. Beautiful number. But... Anyway, exactly, yeah. But anyway, mate, I know, right? Thanks back there in the past. But um, yeah, your book, mate, let's talk about that because it is incredible. I mean, when I was reading it, and uh, especially, I'm sure this is be a great story to talk about, the Nebworth story as well, mate, eh? Okay, well, the book is, is called Too High, Too Far, Too Soon. I think it's currently out of print, actually. You can get it on Kindle, all the Sims and copies, doing the rounds. Um, and there's also a, a really great podcast that I did with Dodge Woodall's Interesting Lives, where I talk about a lot. And Dodge, Dodge does some great interviews as well. Um, but the, the book sort of deals with a lot of what I just spoke about, childhood, trauma. And oh, there's Lonnie. Is that Lonnie in the background? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and me trying to cope with all that stuff and using drugs and alcohol as a way of trying to cope with, with those feelings to the point that, you know, it works for a while and then it, and then it didn't work. And knocking about in the 90s, um, you know, fucking I took, took a lot of drugs and, and I pointed people in the direction of drugs and sometimes that direction was me. Um, and, uh, yeah, one of the people that you've just mentioned was, was someone that I was, had more than a passing acquaintance with shall we say, um, and the Nebworth story, seeing as you mentioned it, is, is kind of it's simple, really. I mean, I I saw Oasis play their first ever gig in London at the Water Rats in front of a couple hundred people and just remember thinking, wow, this, this these guys are pretty good. <laughs> and, and then two years later, um, two and a half years later, on my birthday, August the 10th, at Nebworth, my heroin habit was so out of control that um, I left Nedworth before I think even the first band went on because I got there and I was smoking loads of crack and then I went to go and have a hit, look up some heroin and I realised I'd left it in London. And um, it was a simple equation. Do I hang around and watch Oasis or do I go home and buy some heroin? And the answer to that, as every junkie will tell you, is you go buy some heroin, simple. So... So that was that. And then I even missed Liam giving me a shout out. This one's for the cat in the hat off the fucking stage in Nebworth from where I was fucking watching it on, on the news on telly, sort of nodding out after a bit of gear. So there you go. Don't do heroin, kids. It's not good for you. No, I mean, I mean, we've, me and you have been speaking very openly for years now, Simon. Um, not only are we good friends, but we, we also listen to each other's stories and we've sort of, we're, we're, I, I don't like to use the word mentor and I don't think you would let, like, would like me to use that either, if you don't mind me saying, but you've guided me into the right path. Um, and 
your story it just it just hit home a lot mate and but as we know it did take a few goes with me didn't it eh? <laughs> No, I, I don't. I don't think I know anybody. I really, hand on heart, don't think I know anybody in in recovery that one day went right. Oh, that's me, done and dusted, and, and they never picked up again. I, I mean, I'm sure there are people, but you know, you talk to anyone that's quit smoking, the, the you know, most people they'll, they'll they you know, it takes a few goes and and getting clean or sober for most people takes more than one bite of the cherry you know i mean i went to rehab seven times i had 14 inpatient detoxes coming off heroin I took my fucking skinny ass around the world a few times lay on the beach go i'm never doing that again and then did it again and so you know i'm i'm <laughs> more than sympathetic to the idea that it's it's not easy you know it's not easy and and i needed the help of various institutions often not you know not always but ultimately um i got clean in, in a 12-step fellowship you know i was sat in meetings rattling my fucking tits off for about three months you know just but but there you go that was me people are different so you know i don't judge people who who stumble and fall because really it is ben you know for people like us that that don't really have an off switch the idea of of, of not having anything is quite a fucking bit it's getting your head around that <laughs> quite difficult you know a day at a time is the easiest way as we both know and sometimes it's an hour at a time and sometimes it's 10 minutes at a time you know yeah. but but for anyone who's, who's watching this trust me it does get easier you know i'll just repeat it again i held my mum's hand while she died eight days ago and, and um there wasn't one part of me, not one fucking part of me that thought about having a drink. So, you know, I, I don't know if I could put it in stronger terms than that, really, if someone needs to hear that. And here's the thing. I know, I knew that, that I can stay sober or clean through anything because I've watched other people do it. And they're no different from me or you. They're just people in recovery. You know, there's some things that, that, we need to do i think to give me that choice you know this people call it you know maintaining my spiritual fitness or you know you make of that what you will you know but there's things that i do i think anthony key this actually said it in his book years ago and that scar tissue but him from that awful band the red hot chili peppers he said something about the there's some simple things i need to do on a daily basis and i do them that's he it he didn't say what they were <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is you know whatever it is now as we both know we're both in the industry where drinking drugs is well it's it's around us all the time really isn't it and it's up to us whether we go down that path or whether we just stick to our own lane yeah. um we're going to mention i want to talk about your band high town pirates now i remember i did a show with you didn't i was it the paper dress or the it was in Hackney, yeah i'm surprised i remembered i remember um it was a lovely little setup so it was a shock during the day wasn't it but in the evening yeah. they turned it into like a, a music venue paper dress yeah Is it was it? Been top, top, bottom of, of amherst road in Hackney. yeah they, they put on some great gigs there it's nice you know it's a nice little smart spot yeah so that's where yeah you 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 were on the bill with us yeah or we were on the bill with you and no 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 i i, I was on the bill with you mate i was on the bill with you it was it was good mate and uh it was nice to be with you in an environment where i know it's very tempting but the reason that you weren't tempted is because now if if i'm wrong here please correct me but you surrounded yourself by members of your band who were also sober well High Town Pirates is, is like my, my thing. I'm the songwriter, um, the producer, the T-boy, the manager, the fucking, all of it, really. But I can't do it on my own. Like, I can't really, can't stay sober on my own. I tried for years, so I need people around me. So at that particular point in the history of High Town Pirates, because it's, it's an ever-changing lineup, we just recorded an album, or we were about to record an album, and um, I've lost a lot of friends to addiction but a lot when when my daughter was born and she's 15 now we had this kind of non-religious welcome to the world ceremony and, and 
her mum had four of her best friends there and I had four of my best friends there and they're all dead my best friends from that time from 15 years ago they're all dead they all relapsed and died so I wear this stuff you know close to my heart and uh, that gig you were at was the last gig that High Town Pirates did um, where there were still members of the band that weren't in recovery. Now, I'm not making any judgment about that. People can do what they want. It's none of my fucking business. But when I, I lost a string of friends in, in quite quick succession, and so I decided I wanted to make, make an album, which was the last album we did, not the new one, because I'll talk about that in a second. So we found a studio. I found a studio. It was run by two people that had been sober for a long time. And everybody on the last How Time Pirates album, which is called All of the Above, by the way. Uh, yes, you can get it on vinyl, but it's on Spotify. Uh, everyone who made that album was in recovery. So we had Cass Brown, who was a drummer from Grillers and the Senseless Things, um, Patrick Walden from Baby Shambles, um, various other people that came and went. And, and so that's an album made entirely by people in recovery. Um, the new album is made entirely by people who are based in Margate, where, where I now live. And uh, it's not like a sober album, it's very different. Um, but I remain sober and, you know, I, I have a, a group of men that are in recovery that I, that I speak to regularly. Um, and you're one of them, you know, and we just check on each other, you know, we just, we just check in and, and, you know, this last, like I say, this last couple of weeks being with my mum, you know, I... I there's this expression, I heard it on fucking like, talk sport, I've heard it before about the loneliest place in the world is the boxing ring. Well, I, I challenge that. I would say the loneliest place in the world is in the hospital with your mum at three o'clock in the morning, you know, when she's dying and it's just you and her, you know. That's quite a lonely place to be. And, um, and I was there, you know, eight days ago, nine days ago. And, and, and during that process of being there, and my sister was there, um, you know, I, I, went to a, I went to a fellowship meeting, I, I spoke to several people on the phone, I reached out to people, you know, and I just told them where I was at. And um, yeah, that's how I choose to do my recovery, it includes other people. And that's how I choose to make music. It, I, you know, I, I fucking hate playing solo acoustic gigs, I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. I've done them and I do them, but I don't like it. I like getting like-minded people together, you know, getting in a room, going, look, here's this song I've written, seeing what we make of it. And, um, and yeah, and, and I'm now at that stage where I've got a new lineup of the band together and we've started rehearsing. We're releasing a new single, um, first or second of October called Roses. If you follow me on my socials, then you can see the advert for that went up a few hours ago. Got a new album finished, and hopefully we're going to get out and play some shows. Sounds good to me, man. Sounds good to me because I know we've had many a chats, and I know you, when you have a gig coming up, there's, you're a different Simon because there's a buzz in you. You're like, yes, I've got this gig coming up. I remember when you can't remember you did a, you had a little run of shows. I can't quite remember when it was. I think COVID interrupted it though. But in the lead up, I mean, you, you know better than me. I mean, I was drinking. Well, I was doing, I was, so I was, my, my, my one man show, which was based on, on the book, I kind of picked that up and put that down for a few years and I did some of that. And then, and then I did some high town pirate stuff and then I did some solo stuff. And then, and then the whole lockdown thing just, you know, it did what it did to a lot of people. It just of course. sent everything into hibernation and, and it, it's taken a while, you know, it's just taken me a while. I don't, you know, I don't have a record label or a management or any fucking money to sort of, you know, everything. I have to go and earn the money first, pay the bills, you know, take care of, of my responsibilities. I've got a teenage daughter, they don't come cheap. Um, and she ain't getting any cheaper, you know, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I've never made any money out of music, like never, not a penny. I, I, I would say, if you want to talk about music being a labour of love, I've self-funded everything that, that we've done. So three albums and an EP and some standalone singles. I've probably spent £50,000 in the last six years. Um, 
and uh, you know that's come from crowdfunding from people who like what I do and they contributed there's been a couple of donations you know the Libertines have, have kindly given me you know mates rates in their studio because you know we're, we're pals um, so I can't like I said I can't do this on my own you know I, I, it's not like I'm fucking Elton John you know <laughs> thank fuck you not mate well, I mean, listen, say what you like about it, and he's been sober for, what, 30 years? Fucking more power to him. Oh, uh, no, 100%, yeah. mate, 100%. My, uh, my dress sense, I would say, is, is slightly more modest. I don't know. I've seen a few pairs of sunglasses you've worn in the past, <laughs> mate. They're up in his leg of all, yeah. you, know? <laughs> you touched on about another mutual friend of ours, or friends of ours, the, the uh, Libertines, and didn't Pete do the artwork on one of your albums? He did the art Work for the first album, which is called Dry and High. Yeah, I mean the whole High Town Pirates thing came about as a result of my associations with with two people, really two artists who who uh, I should really try and get them to do a gig together. So Mick Head from Liverpool, formerly of the Pale Fountains, Shack, and now the Red Elastic Band, who is, in my humble opinion one of the greatest songwriters this country or the world has ever fucking produced. And if you've never heard of Shaq, kids, go and listen to him. The man is a genius. Um, so Mick and I are friends and he was, um, how can I put this? I mean, he's spoken about it. So he he came to me for some help, right? And he needed some help. So he came down to mine and we hung out. We stayed at mine for a month and, and he got sober. And I said to him, you know, before you go back to Liverpool, you've got to do a gig sober because I can tell you till I'm fucking blue in the face that you can do it. But that's just a theory. But if you actually do it, it becomes a fact. Now, these days, I'm, you know, the polar opposite of what I was in the 90s. It's kind of poacher term gamekeeper. So I'm a recovery coach. and I work with mainly musicians, creative oddballs, you know, like yourself, um, because I get it. I mean, I get it. And, and, and so Mick, we, we got him to do this gig and he was like, well, if I'm doing a the gig, then you're the support act. Now, that's a bit like someone saying to you, fucking, I don't know, whoever your favourite football player is of all time, it'd be a Fulham player, wouldn't it? I've never heard of, but... No, no, I don't mean, mean that funny. I mean, I don't know who it is, who your favourite player is, but, it, you know, that was like, that Mick Head going to me, you're the support act, was just like... <laughs> but that was the deal so so and he he said so you better fucking pick your guitar up and start writing again so that's what happened and then and then i was on tour with with the libertines a few months after that and, and me and peter would be talking and i was there for the same reason as i've been with mick and just trying to help peter make a few better decisions as they say and and, and you know he's fucking in such a good place these days but he was like, well, you know, it's easy for you to be so. You'd have to go on stage. And I'm like, well, put me on stage then. So he said, all right, on my solo tour, after this tour, you're the support act. So I did a whole solo tour supporting Peter. And, and, and so it was, you know, I, I have to give both those gentlemen massive credit. Without them, there'd be no high sound pirates. Without them, I wouldn't have started writing music again. Brilliant. I mean, that's, that's even a debate. That's So they're, they're quite, you know... The, the mad thing is, I mean, they're both in, uh, you know, when they were at it, the two of them <laughs> were fucking really, really at it. It's no secret. And they're both sober these days, you know, and, or, you know, certainly not doing what they used to. I'm not saying I've got any part in that for one second, that people ultimately make those choices themselves, you know. But, but I am and will always be eternally grateful to both those gentlemen because they were just so inspirational and so supportive, you know, Peter did the artwork, me and Mick came up with the name High Town Pirates, and um, yeah, part of the journey. It certainly is, I mean, I've got um, a lot of love and respect for Peter, as you know, I mean, he gave me a chance, not once, but twice, um, <coughs> did, the, did the full tour with them in the band, uh, the Seaside tour with the Libertines was in 2016, I think that's when we yeah. met, wasn't it? And then I went on tour with Pete on his solo tour 2018, I think it was. But me and him used to chat a lot. I remember it's always one of them drunken moments, you know, when you're pissed up. And I said to him, oh, it'd be a good idea if I go on your solo tour. And he went, 100%. And, you know, I thought it's never going to happen. And about 
four months down the line, I remember getting a call. I was watching Fulham on the TV and he went, you still up for coming on tour with me? And I was like, fucking yes, mate, 100%. Yeah. But it's just... So how many people in that this, this that industry, everyone flaps their mouth at three in the morning. Yeah, mate, yeah, yeah, yeah. And fucking, they never back it up. You know what I mean? Crazy people actually, you know, so credit to them. You know, those, those people that actually, whatever people say about him, you know, he, he tries... And his new record label, you know, Strap Originals, they're trying really hard to give young artists, you know, a chance. And, uh, that's, that's, that's fantastic. It is, mate, it is. Now, the reason I got you on here um, when, when I started doing these podcasts, you were one of the names I wanted to come up first. And I wanted to break it in after I did a few episodes. And the reason I did is because I wanted to bring up all about the sobriety. And, you know, we've, we've talked about it. We've talked about it more than music. But um, it's, it's a subject that is really close to my heart since I've understood it more. And I know that you're like me. You could talk and talk about it. And I know that when this does go out on Spotify and people listen to it, because that's what people need. I always give people, when people say to me, what, would you, what advice would you give me and stop drinking and that? I say, honest truth listen to a podcast because I used to listen to um, Brandon Novak's podcasts and his story and then sort of got involved with him in a few things and he helped out. And then obviously like yourself, I had yourself on the call 24 seven. You always said, you know, if you're up, just always call me. And that was lovely to have. And it's nice to know you've got them people, um, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to know is, for people out there listening to this in their ears, mate, what advice would you give someone who is struggling? Um, fucking what advice? I mean, look, there, there, there's no, there's no magic bullet. There's no one size fits all, right? What, what works for me, you know, twelve step doesn't appeal to some people. I think it's very much like the last house on the block, you know. Me, I, I tried every other which way. I wasn't having it at all. Having said that, you know, I had a lot of preconceptions about what I thought AA or NA, in my case, NA, was, and I was wrong. I was, I was so fucking wrong. Um, but you know, that's called contempt prior to investigation. So I, I put it to people like this. I always say the same things. I get asked this question a lot. I didn't know how to take drugs. I, I had to learn, and I learned by hanging out with people that did know, right? So I wasn't born with the innate ability to roll a nine skin spliff, in, you know, cook up a hit of coke, make crack, inject heroin, whatever. I learned it. I learned it from people who knew what they were doing. And I watched them, and I observed them, and I copied them, I did what they did, and I got what they got, right? Which didn't turn out too well for me. So, if people are thinking about getting clean, sober, I say the same thing. Go and hang out with some people that are doing it. And watch, and listen, and learn. Or you might learn something, you know. That's what I suggest to people. So, wherever that might be. So, you know, the, every town in the country has a sort of local authority drug and alcohol centre. Like everything else, you know, in that area of society, the NHS, they're all fucking massively underfunded and oversubscribed, you know, um, and it could be quite demoralising. And I think that's where the whole fellowship stuff comes into its own, is that, you know, you can walk into a meeting, a CAA, where fucking just look it up online and it doesn't cost nothing and they're, and they're all the time. So that's kind of what I say to people, really, is, is you know, there are, like you said, there's loads of great podcasts from people that have got clean state clean for you know a long time um, I'm one of them and um, and yourself you know and just ask a load of questions because I think this thing about um, not asking for help it's kind of endemic particularly in men it's kind of oh, so I don't know if you see this weak right well I mean to tell you that, that, that you know there's addiction is smarter than you, more powerful than you, and it will fucking wipe the floor with you. 
you know, as and when it chooses, you know, alcoholism the same, you know, when you take your time to look at the casualty list of people, and these are just famous people, let alone normal people, and you will see a litany of really intelligent, high achieving, super smart, super successful dead people. So, you know, I met someone when I was a few years is in recovery and I, I, I don't, won't mention their name it, it doesn't matter who they are but let's just say musically uh, or creatively they are one of the probably top five artists of all time of all time right so when i say the word genius i mean genius i don't mean the fucking guitarist out of Sabian. no offense to him but i mean i mean you know fucking and i saw this fellow and he was in this meeting and i thought to myself if someone with his intelligence, wealth, creative ability, genius, talent, etc., etc. If he's sitting in his fucking church hall on a Tuesday night, getting another day clean, then why the fuck would I not want to do it? You know, that, that tells me that you can't buy your way or think your way or fuck your way or whatever, play your way out of this condition if you have it. There are some things you have to do. So that's how I chose, chose and still choose to view it. You know, that I need other people. So if you're sat there, you know, like I said on, on that thing I did with Dodge Woodall, you know, you can find me on, on social media. My, my inbox is open. If you need a bit of help, a bit of guidance, drop me a message. You know, and if I can help, I will. Lovely, man. Lovely. Same, right? You, you, say, you know, I'm sure you get plenty of people asking your... You know, so everybody's different, but the, uh, and I say this, all, the only thing that doesn't work is doing nothing. You've got to do Great. something in recovery. Great. You've got to do something. Great message, man. Great message. Now, before I leave you, I want to know, what is the next 12 months old for you, mate? Okay, so um, I've finished the third High Town Pirates album, which is called World Wilderness Hill. There's a single I mean, in a couple of weeks' time called Frozen. Um, and there might be another track coming out before Christmas as well. I've finished the first draft follow-up to Too High, Too Far, Too Soon. Um, so I'm 135,000 words written, um, and it's called The Other Side of Nothing, um, which is about kind of what happened after I wrote the first book. So the sort of that's the, the snazzy hit sounding title of the book. Um, and the working title of the book is I Survived 20 Years of Addiction, But My Midlife Crisis Nearly Killed Me. So that's kind of about all the stuff we were just talking about, you know, being being in a band in your 40s and 50s and, you know, just loving it so much and, and having no success at all, like none. Like fucking nothing at all, like being ignored in a way that you couldn't even make up. I mean, I, listen, I, I, Q Magazine likened our first album to Scream of Delica and Arcade Fire. The Loud and Warm magazine said that my songs are like on par with Elliot Smith. No one fucking listens to them. <laughs> like, it's mad. No one listens. Anyway, whatever. So there's going to be a new album. Maybe a few people will listen to that. Um, I'll still be clean and sober in, in 12 months' time. I can guarantee you that because I've got no desire to not be. Um, and and um, there'll be some High Town Pirates gigs with a full band and there'll be um, some smaller shows with just me and an acoustic guitar and a bit of chit-chat and a kind of, you know, in the run-up to hopefully the publication of the next book. Um, Liverpool might win the league or the FA won't win and fucking no chance mate it's the Liverpool are going to win I'll tell you I ain't going to win anything Chelsea we're not, we both know that right? they're going to win nothing I'm happy with that mate I'm happy with that so I'm going to go and see I'm going to go and see the Reds obviously at the first game of the season I'm going to go and see them as much as I can um, my daughter will be 16 I'll, I've just celebrated my fourth wedding anniversary with my wife last weekend um, life goes on Good man. Well, Simon, thank you very much for giving me your time tonight. And I know that this podcast, when it comes out, is going to help a lot of people. And you know that as well. So thank you very much, brother. Bless you, man. See you Look soon, yeah. after yourself and enjoy the rest of your week. All right. God bless you, mate. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And there we go. That was episode 16 of Talking to Mod. Um, I know this podcast is really going to help people out there. 
the message is loud the message is clear we can recover enjoy the rest of your week and i'll see you soon the name